I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community? Peace, family. Um, I hope everyone's doing well today. Um, you know, this is going to be um, a very uh, informal, well, not informal, informative show um, today with Professor James Small. Um, you know, we we love his uh, storytelling and how he just lets us know um, all the good stuff. Um, so before we bring him on, I just want to just give a shout out to everyone. Uh, peace in the chat. We see that um, Craig Samuels got to us early and said he could not wait for today. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, I want to say um, hi to uh, Mitchell, to Marcus. Um, and I, I see um, Silver Stream Salome. I think that's the name. I probably should have my glasses on. Um, but peace to everyone who is supporting us. If you have not seen Hoppy the film, OK, because we have Hoppy Talks, but we also have a whole feature length film. Um, please, you can go to HoppyFilm.com right there, HoppyFilm.com and get your copy. You can get a digital copy or you can have it downloaded, um, you know, either way. And we also have some other DVDs. We have the Tekken. We have um, Nubia. And we also have a bunch of T-shirts like the T-shirt I have on today. There we go. That's a little happy t-shirt. Um, so, you know, we, it, it's a, you know, just go to happyfilm.com, hit the merchandise and you can see all the, all the things that we have. In addition, another reason why you got to go to happyfilm.com is that you need to sign up for the newsletter. So we have this newsletter that comes out every month at the beginning of the month. And it has, we feature five different things. We have some fine financial one-on-one news um, or like, uh, you know, information. And we are working alongside with the appeal credit union foundation. And so they are, um, you know, they, they, they write these articles for us. So they're very informative. Um, so it's very important that you check out happyfilm.com just for that article. It's, it's really, um, it's very, it's really good. And we also have a team, uh, a couple's, uh, yoga team, their husband and wife called black silt. They, uh, write a health article every month. We also have a uh, financial innovator that we feature, somebody from the past that has laid the foundation for us to be where we are today. Um, we also do a little happy update. And then we always, always, always feature a black owned business. And sometimes it's not just one, it's like a few. And so it's really important for you guys to, um, you know, just hit when you go to happy film, you just hit the little button. Um, for um, uh, get connected, and that way we can get your email address and then put you on the on the newsletter list. And also, we send out other things like throughout the the month, uh, um, sort of like sneak previews of things you know that you'll get first before anybody else. So it's really important to go ahead and um, and sign up for uh, Happy Film. I mean, HappyFilm.com's um, you know our newsletter. Also, if you are interested in um, supporting the movement. And what is the happy movement? The happy movement is four different principles. Number one, love black people. Number two, to support black businesses. Number three is to become more financially astute um, with your money. And number four, teach the youth the truth. So if you believe in those principles, uh, then you know you may want to be one of the supporters of Hoppy, and you can do that easily. We have there's several ways you can get in. Now, the easiest way for everyone, like everyone that's watching right now, is for you to like this video and to share it with three other people. Okay, that's one way. So, you know, this social currency is really important, um, and this is how we're able to keep making videos and to get them out to more people to hence to spread the word about the movement, um, and also know that uh, anything that you give us, we give right back to the community. That's the other piece. Um, you know, we practice those four principles every day, all day. So one way, social media. 
get everybody just like like this video and share it to three other people and also make sure you're following us follow us and subscribe to us on youtube on facebook instagram and twitter and you can get at us at happy film now the other way that you can support us is by donations you know we operate on donations <laughs> and so anything that you can give um we're not picky we are very appreciative but you can um get us on the super chat if you're on youtube there's just a little button right there you can hit uh you can go to cash app it's happy film see happy film is the answer for everything if you want if you can't find us on social media hit happy film if you want to find us and donate some money to us Go to Cash App and it's Happy Film. And also, um, if you go to HoppyFilm.com, there's a button there that you can um, hit and, uh, and contribute to our GoFundMe. So we're very, you know, um, grateful for all the support that we've been given. Um, and we, you know, you give it to us and we give it right back to you in form of programming and, and a lot of other things we got coming down the pike. Um, so. Make sure, happy film, get your newsletter, sign up, get some merchandise, and make sure you're following us on everything, and then slide us a little money if you can, okay? Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce to you Professor James Small. Now, y'all know him because he's been on our show. We're, you know, I'm going to have to sit down and figure out who's been on the show more. Has Is it Dr. Renoka Rashidi, or if it, or is it Professor James Small? I don't know, but these I love these two brothers. So let's uh, welcome Professor. James Small, how you doing? I'm good, Felicia. Good to be back on Happy Talk. Yes, yes. You know, we, we love it when you come. Everyone's so happy, you know, very, very happy. So now, um, so let's just start with the, let's start with the beginning, okay? Um, when, or how did, or did you, or when have you met Malcolm X? Well, I met, Brother Minister Malcolm X, and that's July of 63. Okay. Um, and then the question is, how did I meet this man? And uh, I guess it was the winter of 62 or the fall, spring of 63, I saw him on television. Uh, he lived in New York. I lived in South Carolina, um, Georgetown on this little plantation, Arcadia. And um, I saw this brother on TV, just a news clip, whatever was going on, but it was very powerful. And uh, my mother and father lived in New York. They had moved up there like most mother and fathers from the South to work, and we were staying with our grandparents. So I told my mother I wanted to meet him. My mother being the revolutionary spirit she was, that summer in June, when I got out of school, she had my big brother, Ernie, drive me to New York because we lived on 115th Street between 7th and 8th, and the temple was on 116th Street between 7th and Lenox. Yes. And so me and a brother named Dwight, who I met after I got to New York and we got to be close, went to the temple one day, but he wasn't there. And we went another day and he wasn't there. And the brothers told us that he was giving out flyers on 141st and 8th Avenue. And that was an easy place to find him because I worked in that grocery store packing bags. My brother worked there, so he got me a little gig there. So we went to, it's called Food Family, I think, something like that. Um, and we went to 141st and he was there with a group of men and they were giving out flyers in front of the supermarket. And that was one of the biggest supermarkets in Harlem at the time, food family or something. And the flyer was in opposition to the March of Washington, which was coming up in August, a march that my mother went on, by the way. And so I went and introduced myself being very, a 16 year old from South Carolina he looked like a 20 foot God to me. And I told him, I like what I heard him saying. Um, I like the way he stood up for our people. I don't remember the exact words. And I was gonna quit school and come and join him. And he put a halt to that immediately, um, telling me why education was important uh, to our people. And that education was one of the ways that we were free 
uh, people, and I needed to go back home and finish school and then further my education. And I was actually a little bit disappointed in, in that response, but it hit home, you know, that I got it. And that's the only time we met, the whole conversation between the three of us, right, him and myself, may have lasted 10 minutes. But that had such an impact on me. When I went back home, I remember there was a debate in the class that year, and I decided I would be Malcolm X, and my sister, Friend Shirley was Dr. Martin Luther King. Well, very few people had even heard of Malcolm except for a few blips on the TV. So uh, they thought I was a man out of his mind, you know, or a young boy out of his mind. But I was that infatuated, that um, struck by this black man who stood up that strong. The only other man I knew stronger than him or as strong as him was my grandfather who was our leader, Reverend Andrew Small, but they call him Captain Man in the black community because he was all that. Mm. Um, and so when I graduated high school, because of, we were already involved in the movement down there, you know, picketing the Woolworth, the Strand Theater and the Palace Theater. And then we closed the white supermarket in the black community my last year in school. Wagner's Market, he just, he pulled the gun on a brother over a loaf of bread, but that was the end of that. Um, I was on a football team, Howard High. We were in the schoolyard, this store was two blocks from the school. We got word that he pulled his gun on the brother and he was right on the dividing line. The white community began on that side and our community was on this side. And he was on our side of the street, Merriman Road. And imagine 44, big black young men in full unif uh, football gear, the pads and everything, cleats, sounding like a herd of horses running down on that asphalt, <laughs> heading for this store. And we tore the place up. He was never able to open again. And he tried, but the community set up a picket line from the church across the street. And after school, we would all go join the picket line with our mothers, you know, and the elders. So I was very involved in the struggle in the South and in my community before I came to New York. But having met Malcolm, just that little conversation had radicalized me so far ahead of the others. They wanted me out of town. Ooh. So I was in the Naval Reserve and people need to know this. Um, joined the Naval Reserve to make a few extra dollars to help my grandmother, me and my cousin. And so, I had seven scholarships. I was a good football player. And I chose the one to Savannah State. Um, but white folks had different plans for me. They tricked me by slipping a paper into some documents I had signed to go on active duty in the Navy the day after graduating <sighs> without telling me. And one day my commander, who was a friend, Ray Roberts, young white man from Boston, Ray called, Ray knew I was going to college. He helped me get the deferment. So he called me in one day, said, aren't you still going to college? And I said, of course, I'm going to Savannah State, yada, yada, yada. And he goes like, he reaches in his drawer and pulls his envelope and throw it on the desk and says, no, you're not. I go, what is that? He said, that's your orders from Washington, D.C., signed by the president. You will report to the Pensacola Naval Air Station the day after your graduation, which means you have to leave on the day of your graduation because transportation was by bus in order to get to Pensacola, Florida and report for duty. And I go, and he asked me, did somebody have you come and sign papers when I wasn't here? And I remember I said, yes, yeah, I'm in so-and-so. And he said, didn't I tell you to read everything? I said, I, I read, but we got to the last few. And he said he had to get back to work. So he told me, Small, you got to sign this stuff. And I didn't read the last two or three pages. And that's when Ooh. he slipped in a request for orders on me. So I had to go on active duty, but Ray worked his magic and got me out of the Navy. Um, by the end of July, and I report to football camp at Savannah State at the beginning of August. That didn't work out too well. Um, me and two other brothers from my school, I made the third squad, which didn't give me all of the money, but they gave me a job in the cafeteria making $80 a week, I think it was. All my meals were free. So I was, I would be living large 
anyway, and so <laughs> came home. But my, I had to report to the reserve center in Savannah. So I went the first week and we knocked on the door. I'm dressed, I'm sharp. I'm making sure I'm looking fine. My uniform, starched, tie, curled. Knocked on the door. Some white boy opened the door. And I said, Seaman of Pellis, small reporter for duty, sir. He said, nigga, what you doing here? I said, in my mind, I go, oh, shit. This ain't like my hometown, right? Oh, no. And he slams the door in my face. So I gathered myself. Now I'm prepared to be defensive about myself. I knocked on the door again. And this time, they took a long time. And then two officers came, two or three of them. And I introduced myself, gave them a salute, had my orders, and asked me, how did you get orders here? I said, I didn't know I was the first black to integrate, to go to this place. Oh my I, God. The, the kind of segregation in Mississippi, Alabama, and Arkansas didn't exist in South Carolina where I lived. Black had a very dominant role, especially in Georgetown where we were majority in the county. And so I, I wasn't aware. The reserve center in my town had been integrated since 1942. So I had no idea I was going to run into this thing. And so now I'm very scared, nervous, trying to figure what's going on. So I told them that I was going to school down the block at Savannah State, which was about a mile down the road, but right off of the same street. I took a bus straight there and would take a bus straight back. So they asked me to come in because they know they had to be Curtis because this is the military. There are protocols and laws and rules. Um, and they go in a, a room where they stay for an hour. I'm standing out there by myself. Other people peeking at doors, looking at me. And um, I guess they were calling everybody in the world. How did this Negro get here <laughs> to be here? So somebody must tell them the orders from Washington, they're signed by the president of the United States. That is his duty station. There is nothing you can do. And so when they come back out, you know, the officers were courteous, but the general population were not. Because they couldn't say anything. They just, the looks, the snarls. And when it's time to line up, you know, you, your hand is supposed to touch the next man's shoulder and the next man's hand touch your shoulder. And no one was then four shoulder length to me on either side. I'm standing at the tip of my side. Oh my and it was so funny because I'd already served in that active duty. I'd served my reserve time. I was a well-trained. I'd been in the reserve already more than a year. And so I was new. I had more seniority than most of the guys there. And um, that night I went. I left after the little classes and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I was jumped by some young white men who, not the men who were in the reserve, none of them bothered me. Um, they were at a drive in down the street. So, but I guess the word got to them. And they didn't cause me any great harm because the people from the reserve center rushed over because I was military, naval military. But this word gets back to the campus where there's over. 80 young men trying out for the football team from all over the South, plus Savannah. So by the time I get back to the campus, you know, the police escorted me back there. The president had to get out of his bed and all kinds of little chatty, chatty, chatters going on. So when I go back, because I went there to report, but that was in my month duty. So two weeks later, I go back again. Now, this is my real duty night to serve and do yeah. that too. They assigned me a guard, it's called a master at arms, but he has a 45 on his hip, he escorts me to the bus stop so I can get back to the college. And those fools try jumping me again. This time, of course, the Navy comes to my protection, nobody touches me, but somebody drives by and fires three shots in the crowd. So that effectively ended my college education at Savannah State because I was too afraid to stay there we knew they would try to say that I had something to do with that shooting, even though the sheriff said, told the president we knew he didn't. Um, I would find out later it was some of my comrades on the football team from Savannah, right? which was they were just doing what black folks do, looking out for black folks. So I get back to South Carolina and I'm afraid they're still coming after me. So I sign up for active duty. And a month and a half later, I'm in the Mediterranean. And serving on a, 
on, on, on a military ship, uh, destroyer leader, under, uh, we were a flagship, Commodore's Run 4, we had a rare apple. And um, I started as a yeoman, didn't like that, that's clerical and all that stuff. I ended up on the deck force with the seamen run the ship. Everybody got battle stationed. I loaded on a three inch anti-aircraft gun doing battle training and a hedgehog rocket doing submarine training. I was good at both, right? But that was not the kicker was, I was the only sailor on the ship that couldn't swim, right? So I spent two years living on the Atlantic Ocean, riding oh my on the gosh. Two or three of them, working the deck force outside most of the time at night, staring the ship and so forth. And I could not swim. I still can't right, to this day. <laughs> but at any rate, my big brother would always keep me up on Malcolm. Okay. And my big brother was like my, my, my first great professor outside of my parents and grandparents. Mm -hmm. He just gave me until today. He's 83. If I fail to call, like yesterday, I didn't call to tell them about May 19th. I got that call. Just want to see what you're doing. Is that I know what that means. Negro, why didn't you call? <laughs> why didn't you call, <laughs> yeah. Um, and while I was in the Navy, my brother wrote me every month. I got a letter from my big brother every single month. Because my girlfriend had dumped me. So <laughs> I needed to hear from somebody, right? But while I'm serving in France in 65, we were in uh, Cannes on the Riviera. And I learned from my brother that Malcolm was going to be in Paris. So me and about 40 brothers, we went over, but he never showed and we never knew why. So we went back to Cannes and I think on to Nice and did our little party thing and a little paddle boat thing. You know what an 18 year old, 19 year old do. And um, went back on our ship, went in, on a trip to Turkey. On way, we get a mail call, and this big envelope is in there for me, and it's from my brother. And when I open it, it is all the, the clippings on Malcolm's assassination. Oh. So, oh. I, and he also sent me the clippings on John Kennedy's assassination. So, you know, in those days, the big photo albums, the big mm -hmm. ones, I got bought one of those from the store, the ship store. And I put all of the clippings in there and I would show it around to people so they could see who Malcolm X was. And about two weeks later, I come to my locker and it's gone. And a young white man, you won't even believe who this young white man was, <coughs> tells me the CID, which is the Central Intelligence Division of the Navy, but like the Navy's version of the CIA, had entered my locker and took my, my book. And so when I went to the executive officer, of course, they denied it and said that that didn't happen. They had no idea what happened. The young man who told me this, who was a very close comrade, because he didn't want to have nothing to do with the Ku Klux Klan, he was the nephew of Bob Shelton, who was then the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Oh, my God. But, but a very nice kid. He was just one of the nicest young men you ever want to meet. Now, the other kind of racist whites wanted to rally around him. He might have nothing to do with this stuff. He hung up with us. Right? So that was a strange, strange relationship. So I would come home out of the Navy, November 66, immediately um, went to look for Malcolm's organization. Um, there was a rally on 125th Street. His sister, sister Ella was speaking and she had all the security around her. And I wanted to show how good I was. I maneuvered through the crowd, through all the security, went to the stage and put my hand on top of her feet. Wow. Just like this. I don't know why I did that. When I did that, Brother Willie Stark, the lead security man, Brother Payne, Brother Josh, they rushed me. And she said, no, leave him alone. We had never met. And she got, I asked somebody for a pen. She wrote her address down and told me to be there at 7.30 on a Tuesday. And I turned around. I didn't listen to any more of this piece and I walked away. So Tuesday, I said, I'm going to outmaneuver this lady. I show up at about 3.30 in the afternoon. Now that day, her, she had on a gala, beautiful African gown, you know, African jewelry. 
-hmm. This day, I knock on the door, and an old lady came with an old wig on and, and, and a black rag hanging off her hair, a feather <laughs> dust in her hand, a dress that was ripped on the side, wearing some flip flops. And I didn't recognize her. So I told her I was there to see Mrs. Collins. And she said in a broken gullet thing, but she ain't here now, boy. She said, I know they have a meeting tonight. You, you ought to come back to that meeting at 7.30. So I left. <laughs> and at 7.30, I came back to the meeting. Here comes the same lady I saw on the step with the feather duster, right, and the ragged dress and the bad apron and the wig falling off. <laughs> now she comes downstairs, this African queen, fully dressed in her gala and everything. I go like, oh my God, I felt so stupid. <laughs> so all the new people had to introduce themselves and I did. And um, you had to have an interview by the security people. And I remember Brother Willie Stark from South Carolina interviewed me. Um, he's still alive. We spoke yesterday. And um, about a month later, he came and pulled me aside and the security team took me in to an office and they put me through the third degree. And they had already known, they had their own little ways, but they knew a lot about my background already because they did have people in the police department who were our loyalists and others. And they said, we want you to go to Boston and work on our security. Cause me, I'm 21, but I'm still a big mama's baby and daddy's baby. I said, well, I got to talk to my parents. <laughs> so I talked to my mother and father and they said, yeah, you should do it. And that began the real close in work, moving to Boston, living in Ella's house, um, being her personal security. Um, I was trained by two men. <clears throat> I was trained by multiple men, but the two men who gave me my primary training was a brother named Willie Stark, who was the security for the whole organization. <clears throat> and he also was in the ballroom the day Malcolm got shot. That was his first ballroom duty. Mm. And um, he might well have been the man who shot Mr. Woods. And I won't go any further into that. Mm. So because what people are just learning, some of us have known for a long time. Um, and the other brother was Haji Sham Jabba. He's a tall, handsome, lanky black man. He was the imam of the, uh, the Sunni community in Elizabeth, New Jersey. But that's the brother that performed Malcolm's Janaza or his funeral. When no one else would come forward, he was sent by the Rabat Alim al Islamim which is the World Muslim League in Mecca. And he was assigned to perform that Shinatha. So he became my teacher who taught me Islam. He was in the Muslim mosque, Inc. And Brother Stock in the OAU became my teacher who taught me military skills that I didn't come home with and I came home with a lot. And um, other security tactics. And so there I was and, and I'm in Boston and Malcolm had a room in Ella's house. A lot of times when people thought he had just traveling, he was just disappeared and go up to Boston in that room and rest and study. And so here I was in this room with all of the notes of Malcolm X, books still open, page still marked, wearing his pajamas, wearing his robe, and it was spooky for a minute. And I had to go to Sister Ella after a few weeks of that and tell her, I do not want to be Malcolm X. I want to be James Small. I want to, like, to fight like Malcolm X, but I don't want to be Malcolm X. And she used to make me his breakfast, you know, and the stone peaches that he liked in the bowl. And that was his big sister. And she missed her brother. And, you know, uh, I learned a lot. She gave me all books that he left there, and I would read them, books that he would read, I would read them. I remember there was one by Camus, especially that I liked. This was a French priest that worked in the, the underground against the Nazi and was called Resistance, Rebellion, and Death. Hell of a book. Um, so that was my introduction into the world of Malcolm X. You know, during that time, I would get to meet his uh, big brother, uh, Wilford, and get very close with him. And of course, his nephew, Rodnell, Sister Ella's son, 
and became very close with him. And another member of the family, Aunt Gracie, was, was his father's sister, other sister that no one talks about. His sister, um, Mary, and they lived out on the Cape and their children. Uh, so I was embedded in the family for years yeah. in a way no one other than the blood was. You know. Yeah. Um, okay, we're just gonna take a little quick little commercial break, guys. Make sure you are liking this video. Um, I saw someone in the chat was like, why is only 17, 17 people looking at it? There's more than 17 people looking um, at it, um, but maybe whichever site you're on, just it's not that many people looking on that side. <laughs> so, but we need to get those numbers up. And a way to get those numbers up is to like and share this video, okay? We're like we need that. And also just leave a little comment. You can leave the little, you know, the little fist, little black fist you could you know thumbs up anything you can just you know um uh you know i see you guys are commenting in the chat that's good leave a comment share it with like three people and also um the funds you know that you guys send to hoppy um it you know they cover us being able to bring people onto the show and just to produce a show every week. But we also um you know we produce a, a newsletter and all these other um entities in terms, and we're also pushing forward the um, Hoppy movement and all those things take money. So anything that you guys can give, please feel free to um, hit us up on the super chat. Um, we can go to our um, our Hoppy Film um, cash app, or you can just go to Hoppy Film and hit the get donated button. So please, please, please contribute um, so we can keep on keeping on. <laughs> um, so, you know, Professor, what, uh, mm -hmm. You know, you said something that um, just kind of like struck a chord to me. I mean, well, I don't know if it struck a chord, but it was just something that um, stood out to me when you said that that they couldn't find anyone to do um, the um, funeral. You know, run, you know, his funeral, Malcolm X's funeral. Right. Yeah. Can you just kind of talk about like why that was happening at the time? Yeah. Because that, there was a perceived war between the nation of Islam and Malcolm X. And there was the hostility and bitterness that got physical during that period of time. And people were just afraid. The Orthodox community who today embraced Malcolm did not embrace him then. Mm. Like they saw Malcolm as coming and kind of like taking over their thing when he became an Orthodox Muslim and a Hajj. Today they want to own him, but not then. So El Hajj Jaber, who became my, you know, he was sent, there's an organization that really informs, I won't say run Islam, it informs Islam and it credentialized people. I was credentialized by them as an imam to teach in the West. It's called the Rabat Alim El Islamim. Any Muslim know what I'm saying. Some call them the World Muslim League. Some call them the Rabatau, and it's based in Mecca. Okay. And it has representative from every corner of the world in Black America. And when I got there, I met the Black American representative in 74 when I went to Mecca, and he was Pakistani. And until then, I didn't know the Rabatau existed. Mm. But I would meet with the entire Rabatau the full body and that's a whole nother story mm -hmm. uh, i am el hajj amin ashahid james small i have a right i don't have a ceremonial hajj i have a hajj um i don't use the title um but it's it's an interesting history there but to come back to malcolm when i came to the organization Contrary to what most people think, the OAU was not dead and is not dead. So I was trained besides my primary training, Brother Stock, there was Brother Josh, Brother George, Brother Abe, Brother Ant, Brother Gresham, Brother Davis, uh, Brother Freeman, and others, you know. And the man who taught me the most about the street was a brother who I, I exalt. His name is Sunni Malik. And anybody who's old enough and hear this know who Sunni Malik was. Sunni Malik was Bumpy Johnson's man that covered down on Malcolm X. 
okay? Because people think that movie, The Godfather, is a fake. No, there's a lot of um, movie fantasy there, but there's a lot of real history there. And Sunni Malik, until the day he died, was my mentor. He was a gangster, straight up street gangster, and one may have even called him a hitman and, and all of that, but he was my father and my teacher in the streets yeah. of Rome. Um, he was the hip hopper before the hip hop, okay? He wore his big cap like, uh, <laughs> he dressed in lace suits with rings on every finger. Wow. You never saw him without a 357 on one hip and maybe uh, uh, a 25 in his boots. You know, um, when he walked the streets, everybody understood that's Sunni Malik. Don't nobody. And because I walked beside him as a son, didn't nobody think of anything. Contra. Mm. And he was also a bodyguard for Adam Powell. So that's how I got to meet Reverend Powell, doing security for him beside Brother David White and Brother Sunni Malik. Oh, okay. And during that period also, we had um, two brothers who headed the Black Panther Party office in the Bronx and one headed the office in Harlem. And I was the liaison between the OAU and the Black Panther Party. Both of those brothers, like many of the brothers from the Black Liberation Army, cut their tooth in the OAU under Malcolm. <clears throat> a connection most people do not know about, but they need to study real history. And one of the brothers who ran the Bronx office was Baba Zaid Shakur, the husband of Asada Shakur. Oh, and the wow. brother who ran the Harlem office was Lumumba Shakur, the husband of Afini Shakur. So that, that was my world that I grew up in the movement in. Um, and then we could come to, you know, really talking about, I just want to let people know how I got into this. Yeah. Um, and, and all these blessed people that God and the ancestors allowed me to be tutored by and comrades with. And one brother who I dearly want to mention, Montu Matsumela, who was now an ancestor, but he was liaison between the Black Liberation Army and OAU. And I became that mouthpiece for the BLA in the early stages for propaganda they wanted to get out. So that's the world I come out of before I was a professor, right? So that people know when I became a professor, because I was assigned to go to city college and help take it over, and I just stayed. Um, but that's that's the world. Then it was Malcolm's world. I was at his Ellis. Collins' sister, Ella L. Collins, Malcolm's sister, who literally raised him for most of his, his uh, young life. Um, she was as much a mother as she was his big sister. Um, and he had an auntie in the house also, Aunt Gracie, his father, other sister, and Aunt his father, other sister, who had graduated from Spelman. Ella also attended Spelman, you know. But people don't tell the story of the world in his life. These powerful, powerful black women, they produce the person we get to know as Malcolm. Mm. And so that's why I like the little ditty that Dr. Nobles give us. History erases the mystery. You know, history yep. erases the mystery. And a lot of time in the struggle, we tend to follow the white man's patriarchal uh, definition of those who are involved. And we focus just on the men in the movement and not the women in the movement. And yet in many instances, the women may be more significant to the movement in that period of time than the men. But in the African tradition, the women always put their men up front. That's a tradition we brought from Africa. We see it in the black church all the time. The church can be a majority woman, but they'll put a male up as the minister. Yeah. Because that's a tradition they brought with them from home. And so that tradition lived in our community, even to this day. So when that's how I get involved in the world of Malcolm X, you know, I mean, some of the house, we did a lot of things when they were 
fighting between the Muslim community. We were usually the conflict resolution center, you know, that would go and stop the war. I remember there was a war between the Al-Dalas community and uh, Elizabeth and the community in Newark. And me, Brother Stock and Sister Ella went over to meet with Haji Sham and some of the other imams. And I had never seen so many guns in the civilian world in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and so me and Stock was for the job to disarm these brothers who came to the meeting with their armament and sit them in this one room while the leadership went upstairs to broker the end to this negative conflict. Yeah. So that, that kind of thing we were involved in, as well as many other kinds of things in the community. Um, we used to, we had a, a community patrol. Uh, we patrolled from 135th Street to 145th Street from Lenox to 8th Avenue. And we knocked the crime down 100% which then made the police angry at us. And one night arrested a lot of our brothers. And I had to show up at the precinct with a lot more brothers. Mm. And I, a good black man, and I can call it name. He was Chief Inspector Eddie Waits, who was a wonderful, he was the highest ranking black policeman in the New York Police Department. And of course he had to come in that night and the way he resolved that he let all the brothers out, dropped all the charges. And we had to give up our ninchuckers because it was now against the law to use Nunchaka. That was a compromise. Hey. But he had them issue us the new batons with the little handle on the side, which pissed the yeah. rest of the off. He said, in exchange for your Nunchakas, I'll give you this, because your patrols save us a lot of work. Yeah, I can you know, we, imagine. We yeah. Elders from the train station home, things like that, which nobody ever talks about. You know, we weren't just walking around looking black. Okay. <laughs> I like that we're, walking we're around. Helping our people, right? I like that yeah. look, walking around looking black. Looking black. <laughs> a lot of people walking around looking black. Now they walk around on social media sounding black, but we were actually in the street. Um, I was at the opening of the first breakfast program for the Black Panther Party as Ella Security. Yeah. Um, and then me and Sunni Malik and students from City College opened the second breakfast program on 125th Street by just taking over the YWCA, just took it, you know, wow. um, back in 69. Um, so I come from that. And now we can go to my spiritual teacher, Brother Minister Malcolm, and talk about who he was and why all of us felt then and now this loyalty to him. You yeah. know, we do a pilgrimage at his gravesite every May 19th. And this was our 56th year. I don't know what black president was doing anything ceremonially for 56 years. And so you see the young men in white, they symbolize the Sudanese tradition of Islam that Malcolm was beginning to study under the Shekha scene. And then you see a chair with his picture in a drape in red, black, and green, saying that the chair of that level of leadership is so empty in our community. We have many good leaders in many areas, but that level of ethical, moral, principle, courageous leadership has not been filled. And his grave, his and Sister Betty, Mother Betty Shabazz, the, the grave we drape in the red, black, and green flag throughout the whole ceremony. Wow. Um, so, and, and there are rituals that we do. We have the Muslim community from the Mosque of Islamic Brotherhood, which was founded by one of Malcolm's students, Imam Taufik, who Malcolm sent to study in Egypt at the El Azhar University. And so they are a comrade Islamic community that do the prayers, the Islamic prayers. And then Sister Oyanike from the Yoruba community do the Yoruba play, prayers. And this is the first year in more than a decade we didn't have the Akan community there to do the Akan prayers. Yeah. Um, and, and how many years? Oh, you said 56 years you've been doing this. 50, this is the 56th year. 56th yes. year. So, so I'm the assigned in writing administrator of the Malcolm X Pilgrimage Project, what it's originally yeah. called. Yeah. And there's other things that you make sure happen on, um, on, on May 19th every year. You were telling me about how, you know, you, your kids were now allowed to go to school and oh, how. Um, none of my children ever went to school on May 19th, ever, yeah. cradle to now. 
Um, same days with my grandkids, except for maybe one or two who's not in the region. Because we consider this the our sacred holiday, our holy day. Um, in uh, 1965, Sister Ella sent out a communique to all the UN nations and the Caribbean nations and uh, declaring this to be Malcolm X Day. We don't want the government of the United States or any state to declare nothing. Absolutely. We made that de declaration in 1965. And at that time, no one was flying the red, black, and green flag. And on May 18th, 1965, we launched the red, black, and green flag that was brought to us by the Honorable Marcus Garvey again. And it's been flying over the black community ever since. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I was um, out and about in Harlem and I noticed that everything was just shut down. Yeah, you know, that was December course. 12th. That's my comrades. I uh, yeah. saw Sister Collette calling me while we were on. I'll call her back from the December 12th movement. Um, they shut it down um, yeah. on 120 feet from 1 to 4 every May 19th. Yeah. I think they've been yeah. doing that for 20 something years now, you know? And um, the, the, that's one of the strongest black nationalist organization in the black community who I don't think get enough attention for the work that they do, mm. the December 12th movement. Sister Violet Plummer, um, Sister Collette, uh, Brother Omawali Clay, um, Roger Wim, and so many others in that organization who've been in this movement for decades doing the work. You know, then there's the Malcolm X Commemoration Committee that supports us. Um, that's but one of the strongest element is the Sons of Africa. The people you see facilitating everything at the grave, that is the Sons of Africa. And they've been with us for more than 37 years. You know? So we don't wear uniforms or anything, and we don't have decals, and we don't have a meeting hall. But we exist. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you? What do you think we should be doing, um, or do you think we should be doing more to honor Malcolm X? And and what is like honoring him? Um, look like, yeah, look like that's yes. What does do it look the work like? that he was doing? Mm -hmm. The best way to honor Malcolm. A ceremony is good. We should take our time once a year and have a ceremony spiritual tribute. There's nothing wrong with it. But there's 364 other days. And in those other 364 days, we should be doing the work that he was doing, continuing that work, and yeah. the work he told us we should be doing. And one of them is really using the ballot as a weapon. He didn't say the bullet or the ballot. In that speech, which is world renowned, he said, the ballot or the bullet. Mm. And yet we pretend he only said the bullet. And that's why we got in a lot of trouble in the nationalist community. And we lost the high ground to the white left controlling the moderate black elements in our community around the electoral process and who ends up running for political office. Because we didn't seize that high ground when he says the ballot, okay? Which is a weapon that we must use, you know, like they say, all politics is local. We should determine who's our school board person, who's our community area board persons through the ballot. We should determine who's our city council persons, yeah. our state assembly persons, et cetera, through the ballot. And then who's our national persons. You've got a weapon, use it. You can't let America says, I'm in America, I'm fighting America, and you don't use the weapons at hand. Don't make any sense. It's not even logical. It's not Malcolm. Mm, it's not Malcolm. Not Malcolm. And so study Malcolm. Don't create your Malcolm. Study Malcolm. <laughs> Listen like to that. Malcolm. Learn from Malcolm. You know, and never forget Malcolm didn't create himself. You know. He came through an enormously strong African family, and he had the opportunity to meet an enormously strong teacher named the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who took what that family had given it and helped him hewn it into the great leader he became among us. 
And so let's stop the separation le- le- uh, rhetoric that white folks have planted in us. Booker okay. T. Washington is there, Marcus Garvey is here. Uh, the boys is here and this one is there. No, that's our enemy's divisive language. All of these leaders contributed to us. All of them are responsible for what good that's in our life today. Let's learn their relationship. Let's learn the thread that ties and binds them together. Okay? Yeah. So that we can learn how to build in unity today, as Malcolm wished, and, and try to instruct us on what unity and Pan Africanism Pan Africanism is. And it's clear he was a Pan Africanist and he was a nationalist. And when people ask him, said, Brother Mr. Malcolm, what do you mean by black nationalism? He said, black nationalism is where you own and control the economic, the politics, and the culture where you live. If you are not fighting to own where you live, you're not fighting to own the real estate where you live, you're not fighting to reinstill the values of African culture where you live, then stop using the word black nationalism because you're just playing with Marxist left false interpretation mm. black nationalism. Yes. And, yes. And you say you're Pan African? Yes, Malcolm lived out Pan Africanism. He knew they were gunning for him. People wanted to kill him. He goes up against the CIA, against the FBI, he visits it all over the continent of Africa, meeting with the different presidents of Africa. He's meeting with the presidents and, and ambassadors from all over the Caribbean, Central South America, knowing his life was in danger, but he was making an effort to use that thread and sew us together as one Ooh. seamless African cloth. That's Pan-Africanism as its best. And I remember, I think it was 1985, we were in Uganda and my mother, Dr. Betty Shabazz, and I call her my mother and my big sister, we were attending the eight Pan-African conference. And there's some from the left who don't want to acknowledge the conference, but yo, it happened, okay? And we were there and every president in Africa was there and Muammar Gaddafi addressed it. And Sister Betty had to leave a day before it ended. And she gave me and Viola an assignment, but she gave me the assignment and I went to Sister Viola, who had, with the December 12th helped write the resolution where the entire conference made of all the presidents of Africa declared in a resolution that Malcolm X was recognized as a premier Pan-Africanist and an example mm. of the Pan-African world. So no history and it'll erase the mystery. Yeah. And how and um someone just said in the in the scene that Malcolm was a realist. Yes. He dealt with the fundamentals that people need to have economics, they need to have politics, and they need to have culture in their hands. But he also understood that people needed to be able to provide food, clothing, shelter, and safety for themselves in the community. That's what we're fighting for. We're not fighting for somebody's ideology. We're not yeah. fighting for somebody's religion. We're using religion where we can. We're using ideology where we can to help people get in a position to provide food, clothing, shelter, and safety. And Malcolm always said, make it plain. Make it plain. Make people understand. This is not about saying what my ideology is or what my religion is or who my God is, who gives a damn because the ideology, God or religion did not protect us from the crack we're in today across the African world. But if used appropriately, those tools can help us get out of the mess we're in. And what Malcolm was showing you, how to use those tools appropriately. Yeah, which is the happy connection. Uh, you're, you're, you are the oh, yeah. official. Yeah, you are the official happy connector. A happy river man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you, could, well, you know, yeah. Malcolm definitely. You know, people don't realize Malcolm when he went to Egypt, he went to the happy. You know, mm-hmm. and he went to the pyramids. You know, and he visited the great temples because he he had to understand. You got to remember, this is a very learned man. This is not some guy who just read a book and put a, 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 what do you call this thing, a blog. This was a man, before he got out of prison, had read and absorbed 
to the level of multiple PhDs, the body of knowledge that one is expected to have with a PhD. So you got to understand that. What is a PhD? It's telling them that, that you're the, a doctorate of the, a particular philosophical body of knowledge about a particular area of life. Well, this man had already earned his PhD before he met the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He had already remembered nearly the entire dictionary. Who in the world does that? You know? He had studied, and just like he told me that day on the street, education is one of the things that will help free our people. I didn't understand it that much when I was young, but as time went on through life, I understood what he meant. Well, who's going to be the doctor in your community? Your enemy or you? Who's mm. going to be the lawyer when you get in trouble? Your enemy or you? Who's going to be the judge when you get in your trouble? Your enemy or you? And so, and this is where Malcolm, there with his beautiful, handsome, strong, godly self, standing at the pyramids, where he shows us how happy the beautiful river they call the Nile that we use for the symbol in happy talk. He showed us how we can take the elements of the black community, bond them together to make a happy river, to produce the economic politics and culture that's desired and necessary for people to provide food, clothing, shelter for themselves. You know, he worked with the church from the mosque. He was a brother to Adam Clayton Powell. He reached out to Dr. King in that last year, and Dr. King reached back. There was actually a meeting at Ruby Dee's brother house, Tom in Queens. Two weeks before he died, all of the civil rights leaders came. Dr. King couldn't come because he had a prior meeting, but he sent his representative. And all of them agreed to work together with Malcolm. And Malcolm would work together with them, the so-called movement. And Fannie Lou Hamer invited him to come to Mississippi. That would have been the week after the weekend in which he was killed. If he had stayed alive, two weeks longer, he would have been sitting at the UN, addressing the UN, sitting beside Ernesto Che Guevara. Mm. You know why they killed him? You wanna understand why they killed him? Hooking up with the civil rights leader on the domestic front, and brothers had given him time at the UN where he's gonna be sitting with Che Guevara addressing the United Nations. We lucky he didn't kill him two weeks before that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, he was he was connecting so, it. He was oh, connecting. he had he had connected. That was the yeah. that 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 was the happy river right there. He yeah. took all the tributaries, like the river that came from the Congos, the rivers that came from Ethiopia, the river that came from Uganda, the uh, Lake Nyanza, to make the happy river that brought us all the abundance in ancient Kibbutz. He took that concept, and he was beginning to make the political pan-Africanist and nationalist and ideological river by bringing Blacks from Cuba, Blacks from Jamaica, Blacks from Guyana, Blacks from Tanzania, leadership from Ghana, together in an African oneness, the happy. The happy. Yeah, he was a bad dude. Yeah. And, and you know, again, you know, I'm working on this project called The Godfather of Harlem, and I've gotten a little feedback criticism, but mostly I've gotten compliments but Sister Rosemary Mealy, who's one hell of a scholar and an activist for all the years. I'm at 75, I've been in here a long time. I, I don't know a time when I didn't know Sister Rosemary. And we had, we was on the web the other day and she brought out something. We knew met with Fidel Castro when he came to Harlem, but we didn't know it was Malcolm that invited him to Harlem when the hotels downtown wouldn't give him a place to stay. But what I didn't know, which adds support to the work I'm doing, that Malcolm turned to his friend Bumpy Johnson, who paid the bill for Fidel Castro. Wow. Which tells you the depth of Malcolm's and Bumpy's relationship that he can get him to pick up a bill that big. Right? So I thank Sister Rosemary for that one. Um, and people need to know that so they can understand that we need to learn our history to get rid of the white man's newspaper and television mystery, which mm -hmm. they try to call our history, you know? Yeah. And, and, and then we can work our black magic. 
Yes, yes. I was Bill our, Bill our happy, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. And speaking about building our happy, you guys like and share this video. Please um, you know, keep the comments coming. Um, that's another way that we can get out. Um, you know, we can really beat this algorithm. We have to crack it. There's things that are out there that's cracking, you know, the um the internet that's probably not really good for us, but we can do that if we just like and share this video with Hoppy. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, please contribute. Uh, your money goes to uh, help us to fight um, the Hoppy movement, just like all the things that Professor Small is talking about. All these things back then took money and resource. So it was very important that you, um, you know, contribute to us. You know, whatever you can. Um, you know, any any amount we're happy with. <laughs> so just please um, contribute. You can do a super chat. We have the Hoppy Film um, Cash app. Let me put that up there for everybody to see it again. Um, and or you can just go to happyfilm.com and hit the uh, the um, the donate button. So three ways to, to send us some money so we can keep fighting, um, fighting the fight and bring in, you know, guests like Dr. Um, uh, Professor James Small, you know. And, and, and I'm going to say something to people so that they get it. I've been involved in this movement all of my life that I can remember, my family was, grandpa was, father, brothers, mother was. And with all of that relationship with Malcolm's organization, with his family, you don't see me marketing that to sell me, okay? Mm. I want people to get that. Yeah. I could, because I became the imam of the Muslim mosque, the only imam to follow him over the Muslim mosque. I am al Hajj mean Shahid. I earned it the hard way during hard times. But you don't see me project that to project me. Yeah. Okay. So study Malcolm. Because the one thing about that man, he was humble. Yeah. He was a humble, brilliant scholar, political activist, revolutionary philosopher and other acronyms we could come up with. But he don't want you to just praise him. He wants you to learn from him. He don't want you to just talk about the work he did. He wants you to continue that work that he was doing. That is the best way to honor him. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. work the way, and that work is to make sure people have access to food, clothing, shelter and security. And the best way to do that is to control the economics, the politics and the culture where you live. And to make sure that, get hold of the land, the labor and resources where you live. And use the weapon he gave you. He says the ballot or the bullet. But before you get to the bullet, let's learn how to, how do you say, um, politicize and monetize the ballot. And we haven't even begun to do it the way we could do it, okay? Yeah. And we've been playing with the bullet, shooting our own people. And I wanna put this out there. People say, well, don't be saying it. In the last 30 years, we've killed over 300,000 of our own. Don't tell me that I'm a no white man right yeah. now. Yeah. Put that gun out of your stupid hand because you don't even know how to use it shooting our little babies down in the street, shooting our women down in the street on the way home from work, killing our little innocent teens because you in some idiot posture call a drive by and don't even know how to use a weapon. If I had my brothers, I'd round all these Negroes up and put them in the U.S. Army for two years. We might get some manhood back given what we have right now because they didn't listen to Malcolm. They'll put a T-shirt on about Malcolm, but they're not listening to him. Yeah. You know, read the books about him. Read about Sister Betty. Learn to understand them. Those were revolutionary workers in the black community. They didn't just look black, talk black. They acted it out and sacrificed their lives to the grave for you. They did as much for you as the Christians say Jesus did for them. 
They did as much, if not more, for you as the Muslims and Muhammad did for them. They did as much for you or more for you as the Hebrews and Moses did for them. So how dare you let them down in the way we are letting them down? How dare you? Yeah, it's about doing the work. Let's do the work. You got to do the work. Yeah. Teach the people, assist the people, respect the people. Don't condemn them because they're deaf. Don't condemn them because they're blind. Don't condemn them because they're dumb. Relieve them of those conditions. Yes. Yes. And I want to say this last piece, because I know I'm going to have to run. You know that, right? Yes. Yes. You have nine minutes. Stop yes. vilifying the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He said, why are you on this mission? Because it's a mission of truth. My spirit tells Stop vilifying the nation of Islam. Stop it. How are you going to tell me you go to work with the devils every day? Party with them, marry them, have their children, and you're going to vilify one of the greatest organizations in our community that have salvaged the most damage of our people. How are you going to vilify the man that gave you Malcolm X? Yes, the family prepared him. And yes, while he was in prison, he taught himself and prepared himself as a vessel but the person who gave him the training and the opportunity and the guidance to make that vessel have use to us is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Stop disrespecting him because the white man disrespect him. Stop disrespecting the Minister Farrakhan, one of the greatest teachers you've ever had among you, because the white man disrespects him. Yes, they had a problem. They had a conflict. And out of that conflict, the enemy was able to use it to cause the life of one of our greatest leaders. But let's not continue the enemy's division yes. with a fantasy conflict between us. And every time you hear me speak, you're going to hear me speak on that. You know, they did it with Booker Washington and W.B. Du Bois. They did it with Marcus Garvey and W.B. Du Bois. And they did it with Malcolm and the Nation of Islam. And we still letting the same devil put us in the same trick bag? Yeah. You know, Malcolm told us about unity. He said, we shouldn't fight. We have to find a way to solve our problems. We have to come up with the necessary conflict resolutions that would allow us to work together for the greater good of the African world. And that's the Malcolm X I project. That's the Malcolm X I'm going to try to imitate and emulate till the day I die. Mm. And that's Thank what I'm going to teach about. Thank you. I know I got to be running. I'm supposed to be with Brother Lenny yes. Johnson and the brothers and sisters. They probably look and say, where is Brother Small? Yeah, um, I think Brother Small is coming. I want to thank um, uh, thank uh, Pharaoh. Twice um, Pharaoh gave us um, some money. Thank you very much. And I see that on um, Cash App. I want to also thank. Oh, let um, me ask one question. The brothers that did Brother uh -huh. Malcolm meet Brother John Henry Clark. Brother John Henry Clark was the one that helped to write the structure and, 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 and the philosophy for Malcolm's OAAU. Of course he met Dr. Clark, that was one of his teachers. He met Dr. Mm -hmm. Ben, that was one of his teachers. Something else people don't talk about. Dr. Ben was at his graveside when he was being buried, throwing dirt in that grave with his hands. And he would come with me on the pilgrimage every year until he passed. No, he quite loved Dr. Clark and Dr. Ben and he learned from both of them. Oh, that's what's up. That's what's up. That's the thread. That's the thread, people, that binds us together. We need to learn history to learn to see the thread. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, okay, my sister. Yes. Th thank and, you. And, and the African so community, remember, take all of the small pieces and bring it together to form your happy river. It's the small tributaries in the community, the small tributaries in the family, the business mm -hmm. from here, the wealth from here, uh, the investors from here, the teachers from here, all coming together to make a community because that community becomes the happy river that will provide the economic politics and culture our people need. So peace and blessings, I'm running. But I'll see you on Happy Talk again soon. Thank you, Sister Police. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. You're welcome. All right. All right. Peace.
Okay, so I want to just thank, I got to give shout out to these people who are um, giving us money. Thank you so much. Farrell, thank you. Um, we also got some cash app love. Um, it is uh, Vicky, Vicky Polk. Thank you so much for um for your don your for your donation and I also want to thank um here we go all about wisdom 365 thank you so much for your contributions um you know this the money that you give us goes right back into the community it's very important that um we support you know um support these things and sometimes you know there's a lot of work that we have to do out in our communities and sometimes we may not physically be able to get there to do everything um you know one of the uh you know besides contributing to hoppy one of the other entities that i contribute to all the time um, is the ace of foundation uh brother anthony uh brother brother anthony, brother anthony, uh, Tomas, uh, Tomas, uh, brother anthony, anthony Browder's uh, organization. You know, I can't get to Egypt and dig, but you know, I can send a few dollars, you know, here and there to help him to continue, you know, what the work that he's doing. Um, and uh, and just to give you guys a little, um, you know, to let you know what's going on next week, we're going to actually have Brother Anthony Browder and Dr. Chike Aqua um, come on the show next Thursday. And we also have something special, I think, um, as well. Um, you know. A, Additionally to that show, that's going to be on Thursday. And I see that there's, um, I'm sorry. And Gary Hatchback. Oh, Gary from Detroit. The D's in the house. All right. And speaking of the, the D, well, so not really speaking of the D. Um, we are actually on location. I'm in Atlanta, in Black Atlanta. Everybody's Black in Atlanta. So anybody that's from the ATL, please, you know, shout us out. Um, you know, uh, shout up, you know, in, in the chat. We're like in Atlanta. Atlanta's really nice. Um, but yes, thank you so much, Gary um, and uh, Vicky and um, Farrell and all about the wisdom. Thank you so much for your contributions. So in closing, um, wait, oh, I think, um, hold on one second. I was Are 15 you minutes too early, so we still got 15 <laughs> minutes. Oh, okay. See, look, you're coming back. You know, I see somebody in the background. So you can help me thank everybody. Um, okay. Yeah, next week we're going to have Dr. Um, um, Dr. Chike Aqua. And I hope I'm saying his last name correct. Um, but it's AQ, I mean, excuse me, A K U A. And Anthony Browder is going to come on the show. And that's going to be cool next week. Um, but yeah, we're just thanking everyone that's given us. Um, some money so that we can keep on, you know, doing everything that we're doing. Um, someone's from South Carolina um, and wants to know how to use Cash App. Aren't you from South Carolina, Professor Small? Uh huh. Geechee. Yeah. Geechee Land. Absolutely. It's, yeah. it's actually Geechee Heaven. Geechee Heaven. Yes, my grandmother's from Geechee Heaven. So. So all he has to do is put, give him your cash app so he learns to just uh, download cash app if he hasn't downloaded it and um, go to it and send you that money to happy so happy talk and continue their work yeah happy talk we need to keep on working all right well you know professor you have anything else you want to add on I was about to close the show well, the key thing is, well, you got papers. You know, like we always say, we always say, do ma'at, talk ma'at, be ma'at. Mm -hmm. Do Malcolm, talk Malcolm, be Malcolm. He left us with a, a concept of Pan Africanism and Black nationalism, and he explained to us in in the most finite detail how it could be used so that people can provide food, clothing, shelter, and safety for themselves and their community. And it fits in the happy um, concept because he shows how to bring the little pieces together to make the big piece, which is the happy river. And since happy is about economic development, Malcolm made it clear, if you can't own the business in your community, you're not about economics. If you mm -hmm. can't own the real estate in your community, you're not about economics. If you can't collectively pull your money together with your other comrades who are Africans, you're not about economics. 
just making some money on Wall Street and buying a big house someplace. And that's not what economics is about. Economics is what gives the group the ability to provide food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security for themselves so that they could then protect themselves against the exploitation, the parasitical behavior of other ethnic community that use them because of their weaknesses. So and this is what you can do. You know, this, is, this is not something far, you know, far reaching. This is actually something we can do. We yes. can do that. Basic stuff. It's basic, basic stuff. stuff. You know. Yes. And that's what Malcolm was. He said, make it plain. He said, this isn't complicated. You know, it's not complicated. Yeah. You have to be what you're saying with your mouth with your actions. Yeah. Be what you're saying with your mouth. When we saw um, Muhammad speak newspaper, Malcolm X created that in his basement, you know, with a few other brothers. Remember under Malcolm X leadership and the leadership of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad before he died, they built one of the biggest black business community in America. Every black community had a, a Muslim restaurant, a Muslim store. Your hardware store was brothers from the nation. Your plumbers were brothers from the nation. Your electrician. They had it right. They followed the Garvey model, which was the Tuskegee model of Booker T. Washington. The thread. The you let the white man cut up your thread and divided you. Look at the thread that unites you. And you understand Malcolm X. Because he read all of those people. He read about Kemet. He read about Greece. He read about Rome. He read about Africa. He read about Booker Washington, Marcus Garvey, uh, T. Thomas Fortune, Martin Delaney, Bishop McNeil Turner, Ida B. Wells, Harriet Tubman. He read and studied these people. And he took the best of the knowledge he could get from them to give us solutions and resolutions to the problems we were facing. So we need to listen to him fresh, anew. Read his biography. Stop playing the white man game talking about, well, Alex Haley wrote it. Alex was the writer, but Malcolm told that story. Yeah. It was life, you know? It and they tell what... you in the book how they were doing it. Yeah. So stop playing. And Be a black yeah. man. Be a black woman. It's the only nation you got. You can go join the other people. You can become a Buddhist and go chant with the Indian community. That's fine. Good solidarity. But the Indian community is hooked up to take care of the damn Indian community. You can go into your martial arts and your Tai Chi and your Kung Fu and hang out with the Chinese. But they'll make it very clear to you, you're not a part of their community. You're going to hang out, especially if they can use you. You can salam alaikum, rahmatullah, all you want, and hang out with the Arabs or the Pakistani. But they'll make it clear to you that they have a distinct community. So you need to bring your black ashes back to the <laughs> black African community. I like that, you know? black ashes. <laughs> and take responsibility for food, clothing, shelter, safety, and community, safety and culture, and take control of controlling the land, labor, and resource in the community in which you live and be in charge of economic politics and culture. And I'm gonna tell you one more thing. You wanna stop police brutality and the police from killing black people? Because none of the things they're doing now is gonna stop it. No law is gonna stop it. They haven't stopped it in hundreds of years. The only way you stop police brutality and murder black folks in their own community is for you to become the police. You can't sit back and say, I ain't gonna be the pig. Then you want the Klan to be continue to be the pig? You want the John Birch Society to continue to be the pig? You want the White Citizen Council to continue to be the pig? Well, if you want to stop the legal use of legal weaponry and laws against your people, you take control of the institution and you become the legal gun. And you become the legalizer of the gun. That's how you build a community, not by running away. Let's train these youth to pass the civil service test. 
and let's follow and protect them so nobody pushed them out once they pass those tests and let them become the police in our community and let's throw these other people out of our community. They can go work as policemen in their community, that's fine. But in our community, our black youth should be trained by our black behinds yeah. to develop the kind of mind to police our community. There's no other way you will stop this until you take it over. Yeah. And there is an access. Take that test, go to the academy, stay in the academy, stay in an organized unit while you're in the academy so we can protect you and then come on and serve the black community. You know? Yeah. And for the rest of you running around shooting your guns or shooting up our community, maybe we'll begin to come up with a rule that said, if you're not going to college and you don't have a job and a business expertise, we're gonna send you in the American military to get some real military training so you can come back and protect the black community. Mm -hmm. Like our fathers did, like the Blood Brotherhood did in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Almost all of those brothers that defended Tulsa served in the First World War. It was formed in New York. It was called the Blood Brotherhood. Nobody talks about them. In Tulsa that day, we beat the white man on the ground. The Blood Brotherhood led the resistance against them, and we defeated their military on the ground. That's why they went up in the air with the airplanes and dropped the gasoline bomb on the city, because we had already beaten them in the military battle on the ground. But you don't know your history, so you're stuck in his mystery. Yeah. I've been out to Tulsa multiple times to celebrate this occasion and to honor these people. I've been given citation by I'll the Tulsa Oklahoma yes. City Council and on and on. So yeah. you got to learn your history to get rid of his mystery. Take the black community back by becoming the community not just the victim in the community, but the people who run the community. Run for the school board, brothers and sisters, and you become the school board person making a decision about your children. Run for the community board. Don't leave it to a few petty bourgeois wannabes being controlled by the white left to run your community under these not-for-profits, which we don't own. Not to know the truth, so to set you free. Truth alone, he said, will set you free. Say that one more time. Know the truth. The truth will set you free. Yeah. He used to like to say this. Truth alone, he said, will set you free. So you got to know the truth, but the petty bourgeois betrayers in our community who's being handled by the white left, who's pretending to be our allies in our community while they're controlling and heading these not-for-profit organizations, which is directing the politics in our community to keep us from having real power. So you better learn to use that ballot, like Malcolm told you. He said, the ballot or the bullet, not the bullet or the ballot. And you've never effectively, we did, we showed with Obama twice, we can effectively use the ballot and kick your butt. We just showed with, with Joe Biden, we can use the ballot as a weapon and kick your butt. But now we have to make sure that those who think as we do get to run for these political offices in our community and vote them in. Yeah. So, like Desalene told us, it's freedom or death. We ought to be tired of our children dying, not just from the guns, but dying in the hospital, poor health care, dying because we're homeless, dying because they're being falsely arrested and put in jail and being abused and, and misused by other black men in what is called sexual manner, destroying these youngsters. So, when they come back in the community, they're so hurt and bitter and hateful. They'll kill anybody that gets in their way. They know what the cycle is they've created. The only way we stop the cycle is we take over the police departments. You're not gonna take it over with a city and that don't work just as America. They got laws and structure. We're smart enough to do what any other ethnic group can do. Take those civil service exam and put on that uniform and begin to demand with a gun on our hip and the law on our side how things are going to go. Let us become the black army in blue. Mm, I like that, the black army in blue. We could do it, but it takes a man and some courage and some sacrifices and some willingness to yeah. do it. Yeah, It's about the doing, like you said, Malcolm, it's not to honor him, you know, to honor, you know, him and everyone you know, all the other leaders that have come, you know, before him to honor them is this about doing the work. Yeah. You know? 
It's about but doing if, you, the if you're not going to take over the economic politics and culture in the community you live in, stop talking. And Absolutely. you can't do that if you don't take control of law enforcement. Stop talking. Yeah. It's a bunch of crap. Get real. You know? Let's be who Malcolm X was as he lived. There's thousands of us, millions of us. Let's be Malcolm X. Mm. Let's be Malcolm X and listen to his teaching and doing what he told us and foster unity in our community. No matter how long you got to sit down and argue it out. Stop just bickering and fighting. The Hebrews is better than the Muslim. The Muslim is better than the Hebrew. The Moors is better than the Christian. The Christian is better than the Moors. The Nationals is better than the pan African. You sound like a bunch of silly little backwards white children. Mm. All of it makes up Africa. Put it together. Yes. You come up with the one. And let's take our community back from those we, whom we gave it to. Let's take it back. Become the police. That stops police brutality. You become the police. And then live in your community with your people. You become the fireman. You mean you can't pass the civic exam because you can get a PhD? You know? Yeah. You don't want to put on a uniform and carry a gun, but you can shoot up our black community and in 30 years kill over 300,000 of our people. Talk about manhood. I don't want to call it what it is, brothers, mm. you know? You want to be Malcolm? Don't just talk Malcolm, act Malcolm. Live Malcolm. Yeah, Michelle said it best, Zolo up. Yeah, From so now, now I'm gonna have to speed to my <laughs> other lecture. But All I'm right, thank you, to come back, you know, thank you. remember, yes. Follow Happy Talk, support Happy yes. Films, learn what the Great Happy River represent. It means that all of the smaller elements and tributaries of our society come together as one and form this extraordinary body that will allow us to build our civilization back one more time. The, ha the happy. Back to happy. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Sister Felicia. Right. Peace and All blessings. Right. Peace and blessings. Okay, guys, you heard it right, right there. Contribute to um, Happy Film. And a lot of what Professor is talking about is in the Happy Film. So it's important you can just head over to happyfilm.com and get, you know, um, you can get not only a download. If you want to just watch it right as soon as you hit, you know, you you sign off here, you can just go ahead and um, and watch it like right now. <clears throat> or you can get the DVD copy. We have some other DV, um, DVDs up there. We have T-shirts and all that good stuff. Um, but it's also important to sign up for the newsletter. Information is power. You have to get you got to get connected in. This is a great way to do it. And you can also donate on our donate button that's on happyfilm.com or you can um, hit us on the cash app at Happy Film. I want to thank everybody for um, for uh, contributing um, with the comments, with the, the likes, the, you know, all the good stuff. And I see Michelle Jewell have, uh, has finally joined the house because we, I didn't see her when we signed on, but she was on the phone listening. So, you know, we almost feel like we can't get started without her. And also a special shout out to John Henry Staples from Riverview, Florida, <clears throat> our elder, and also Dr. Leonard and Rosalind Jeffries, our other elders that are always tuning in. So, um, it's important to contribute, to like this video, share it, and um, and make sure you leave a comment. Until next time, in the words of Professor James Small, peace and blessings. I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community?